I'm Anna Ross. My background is from uh, as a as a clubber. So in the late 1990s, I sort of found ecstasy and the club scene and had a wonderful time <laughs> um, and got really heavily involved in um, harm reduction, but peer led harm reduction. So um, particularly with psychoactive substances. So we weren't really focused on um, opiates. We were focused on uh, club, club drugs and going out to free parties and providing a safe space for chill out and things like that. And that really, um, so I was, I was sort of a clubber and I was you know, working in catering and doing all of that kind of stuff. And then from that, that really kind of inspired a, a sort of passion because what I was seeing, because I started to go into support work and in support work, you work with people who are homeless and with problematic substance use. And I was seeing this dichotomy between the people that I was using substances with for pleasure versus the people who are supporting, who are allegedly using substances for problematically. And sort of just really, that was the beginnings of my understanding of the sort of structural um, impact of drugs policy on the way that you use drugs. Um, and so I became really passionate about that. And I went into Crew 2000, which is the drug policy reform. And then I went and did a law degree because I wanted to become a criminal defense lawyer and defend against the, the awful drug laws. Um, but I didn't get a traineeship and went into academia. And from that, so I started my PhD on drug policy participation or the, the, the role of drug users in the, participa in, the, in the development of policy in Scotland. And in doing that, um, the idea behind that, one of my supervisors was an expert in deliberative democracy. Um, and, par and, and participation uh, methods. Um, so I set up this group called the Scottish Drug Policy Conversations. And the idea behind that was to bring in um, multiple stakeholders. So traditionally, when you're talking about drugs, you have the government, you have your police, you have your medical professions, and then very rarely you'd have your token people in recovery. And generally speaking, it's like people who've been off drugs for 20 years and are drug free and, you know, are there to sort of tell their story. And I found that really problematic because for me, my experience of drugs was always very positive. Well, not always, but, you know, like I've seen a lot of positives. So with the drug policy conversations, it was to try and bring all of these stakeholders together to actually shift the narrative and go, multi, you know, loads of people use drugs. Loads of people enjoy using drugs. There is a small section of society that have major issues with a certain kind of substance, namely opiates and, and pain relievers. And we all know why that happens, you know, because it's deprivation, it's trauma, it's all this kind of stuff. So we need to widen the conversation out because if we accept that drug use is normal within society, we can then focus on this smaller group and go, well, actually, that's not the drugs. That's, that's what's causing that is something else. That's the policies, that's the capitalism, that's a lack of investment, that's a lack of connection, all of that kind of stuff. So we, so we created that group and it was really powerful. And that's when, um, around about that time, I met Fiona. Um, and, um, and then we sort of, Fiona and I sort of started working together quite closely. I continued my PhD. Um, I, as a result of my PhD, I became quite heavily involved in the Scottish government. And I became a representative on their lived and living experience groups. I became a real pain in their arse <laughs> or a thorn in their side, should I say. Um, constantly going, you've got to think about us, you've got to think about us. Um, and, um, and yeah, just developed connections. I've, you know, as a result of my engagement with all of this, I also did the, um, I was a special advisor to the UK um, Select Committee on Problem Substance Use. Um, in Scotland, and that was interesting. And what was interesting about that was um, we still had to focus on problematic substance use, but initially it was like inquiry into drug use in Scotland. And it, you know, th this is, I guess this is just an example of this tiny narrative shift, which is like, no, it's not an investigation into drug use in Scotland, because then you would be investigating all the people that took ecstasy or smoked cannabis, or you know, enjoyed a bit of cocaine at the weekend. No, you're looking at people who have habitual dependent opiate use. So we were able to change the focus from drug use to problematic substance use. And that was quite important for us um, to create that narrative. I'd worked in a lot of sex worker charities, sex worker rights charities, and I had been part, really blessed to be part of, or honored to be part of um, the HIV community. 
which we didn't realise how incredible that was as a movement when it was when we were there, you know, act up and all the rest of it. And then I'd taken a seat back. I'd been doing all different things with my life, and I was part of the recovery community at the time. And I watched a film called The House I Live In, and it. The fire that it created in me, the rage that I felt when I watched that film, because I'd never thought about... I had always thought about drug use in my life and my friends' lives as I thought we were exceptional. And then I realised, actually, this was a designed policy. This was a designed policy created to... Um, criminalise certain drug users of certain class, certain types of drug use. And I looked back and um, I thought about all the people who died, all the unnecessary deaths that we'd put down as drug deaths when they were actually created by state violence, by state stigma. You know, we all talked about, oh, you know, I feel really ashamed and it's like you were stigmatised and that's a deliberate state policy. So I started speaking to my, my friends who had survived and we started reframing our stories. Not about I was a problematic substance user, but, you know, I might have had issues and I might have overused certain substances. But, you know, let's talk about the time that the police beat us or women subjected to violence, you know, where do you go when it's the police that have actually sexually assaulted you? Or my friends who spent years and years in prison, these beautiful, sensitive people who spent years in prison, were sitting in Edinburgh, it was the AIDS capital of Europe. <coughs> it was created by, that was a policy, a deliberate policy, that state agents, the police, mm -hmm. talk about, like they act, and acted it out on people who were using drugs, and we became the AIDS capital of Europe. So that was all stuff that I'd been in the middle of and not realised was policy driven. And so recovering justice was like, how can we change the policies and what would the peaceful solutions be to that? And at the time, a lot of the rhetoric around problematic drug use was, do you know, I took drugs, I became a really, really bad person and now I don't take drugs. And there was also this thing, you know, I smoked cannabis at 12 and then I was a heroin user at 18. We tried to change that narrative. I think we were successful in some ways. Um, 10 years later, I'm still a little disturbed that the rhetoric is, and even in drug policy movements and in social justice movements, the rhetoric is, do you know, I wasn't a bad person. I was a really sad person. I was a really traumatised person. And I mean, I have to say, like, and I know my colleagues feel the same way. Sometimes you sit in a conference and it's like, fuck, I'd just rather be bad. <laughs> do you know, I might have had some agency then, but we've done this thing where we've pathologised the lives of like so-called problematic substance users, you know? And it's like, if we can just tell you how traumatized they were when they were five years old or this terrible event happened to them and now they're taking drugs. And as Anna says, what that does is it bypasses that we're now in late stage capitalism. If you're not traumatized, you're not fucking paying attention. <laughs> you know, if anybody's not traumatized, like what's wrong with you? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And this idea that <clears throat> we'd now become responsible, productive members of society. And again, if you're well adjusted in this society, you know, you shouldn't be. We should all be out making trouble. Yeah. So um, I was starting to become a little disillusioned within the space. And we were constantly getting asked, do you know, tell your story. You know, people did not want to hear me speak about drug policy reform. They were like, talk about this, talk about that. Would you talk about this? Because it's sensational and it creates an energy, but often not an energy that gets us in the room to make the changes. They just wanted our stories. Mm -hmm. 
And Anna and I had huge, like, that's why I met with Anna. And she was like, yeah, I absolutely get this. How do we make a space where we are the change makers rather than just the sad stories that somebody's going to put on a podium? Yeah. Um, and also there's a, there's a thing around, there's a couple of things, pathologising drug users has become the norm. Nobody's questioning it. It's been done over and over and over again. And we often do that in spaces where there are police, police who have done utterly horrific things to people. Horrific things. They've ruined people's, they've like destroyed students' lives. They've arrested men in front of their children screaming and they've taken them off to prison for six years for cannabis. And nobody says, what happened to you in your childhood that you became part of this and you managed to stay in this and, and torture people for smoking, smoking pot? Yeah. Or what happened to you as a politician that made it okay to make benefit cuts to such an extent that people are dying and committing suicide? You, those are not the conversations that we ask other groups of people. So why do we do it with mm -hmm. people who use drugs? So, and I don't think we should. I don't think we should ask anybody those questions. I think they're personal, deep questions that you probably should do in a psychiatric, in a psychedelic, psychedelic assisted, assisted therapy. therapy. <laughs> so what we decided to do was like flip the narrative and instead of looking at what were our supposed weaknesses, it was like, what are our strengths? And then also, this idea that like drugs were bad. It was like, actually, there are no good or bad drugs. There are just good or bad policies. So when we flipped at that, then we started saying, and actually there's some substances out there that could be part of the solution. And that's when we formed, Recovering Justice did come, become part of that. But then Anna and I realised it wasn't the space, and so we create the Scottish Psychedelic yeah. Research Group. But it was also this frustration at this, and it's exactly that, the pathologization of drug use. It was this frustration that every time you walk into a room, when you talk about drugs, it's about the harm. Mm -hmm. It's like about how do we prevent the harm of drug use? How do we prevent, like you say, these poor drug users? And even within the medical cannabis space as well, and, and the other spaces, but... The thing that really fired Fiona and I, I think, to move away from the narrative of harm and into the narrative of pleasure and the narrative of normalization was this frustration. It's like, you know, this, this, it's everyone's always talked about of poor drug users. It's this lack of autonomy. It's like, well, actually, people are using these substances because they're working, you know, like they're working for whatever it is that they're doing. And, you know, I come from an environment where I've, you know, like I say, I've used multiple substances. I haven't had an opiate dependency, but I've been in a relationship with somebody. And there is something, you know, which is like different to an opiate dependency than say, for example, a cannabis dependency. So there are different, there are differences, but you know, I also know people that have used opiates regularly at the weekend for most, you know, for their whole lives without a problem. So it's really dependent on the individual. So yeah, we just wanted to flip the narrative really. And I think like, um, one of the big things that gave us the freedom to do that was the OSF funding. So we got funded from the Global Drug Policy Programme. And that was just, oh, my God, like, that was like a, a sort of, um, you know, when you, when you, I approached uh, the OSF on my own because I was a, I was a, a mum with two children. I was passionate about this subject. Um, I was doing all of it, but I was like, fuck, I need to get paid. I need some money for this. You know, like, I can't do it anymore. So I approached them. And I had several sort of like meetings with them and stuff. And it was just, it was so empowering because they just went, we see you, we see what you're doing. You know, I'm not this big organization. We're not this like massive kind of like, you know, government run organization or anything. It's just two people, you know, who want to make a difference, who are having these little conversations. And they went, yeah, we'll fund you. Just go and do it. And so we've had two pots from them. And it's really kind of actually enabled us to do this what we call soft diplomacy work. So we've had the three events that have taken place over the last three days. And the reason why they're so important is Fiona and I have spent the last five years setting up the networks. So it's things like 
being a thorn in the government's side by constantly emailing them. They know our names, they listen to us when we talk, but that's taken like five years of always being on the scene, always being the ones that are just going to give that different voice, which means we're now listened to. And um, the big push that we've had for these past three days is to try and get the community because it's been quite difficult to galvanize the community in the sense that it's, it's disparate. There's a lot of different people. Like I say, there's like the harm, there's the drugs harm community and that's all quite set up. The Scottish government have been very good. I'd like to say that Fiona and I feel we can get a little bit of, I mean, it was on its way anyway with the Scottish Recovery Consortium. So they were really focused on lived experience. They really wanted a lived experience voice within policy. And like I say, I joined uh, one of the groups and was really a champion for like, not just opiate use, but all use and not just 20 years in recovery, but you know, recovery is whatever you want it to look like. Um, and, you know, that voice was kind of heard, but I like to think, you know, we, we've been on the outskirts of it, just shaking the narrative. I mean, like Fiona, for example, was instrumental in getting the daily record um, on board to, to um, call for decriminalisation of drugs. I mean, that's unheard of. The daily record is what, the, the most well-read newspaper in yeah. Scotland? Well, and we did that on the back of, we kept lobbying politicians. We'd go and speak to them and they'd say, look, I completely agree with what you say, but the daily record... And, I, and at first, you went, the first time you hear that, you think, oh, that's a bit weak. And then when you kept hearing it, you realised, actually, this is, they work, for, they work for their constituents who read these papers. So that's when we went to the Daily Record. Yeah. You said that you would like to take this discourse out from the harm context. But it's quite difficult, right, when, when the media is full of reports of people dying of overdoses. And then, as far as I know, there is this surge of overdose deaths in, in Scotland. So. There is, but this is why we've focused on cannabis and psychedelics, which, and psychedelics includes MDMA, because this focus on harm is all around opiate use. And, you know, you can't really get away from it. It's very difficult to... What I've learned from the policy makers and from all of this is you need to create a story. You need to create a narrative. And like you say, the narrative in Scotland is very much, you know, we have this exceptional drug deaths, you know, there's all these people dying from opiate use and all this. Where our narrative comes from that is like, well, that's, as you say, late stage capitalism. So you can sit there and you can come up with all these different ideas. But the reality is that it's an intergenerational problem that's not going to go away. Yeah. Where we come in and where we want to do it is that actually, you know, well, psychedelic assisted medicine, for example, is probably showing one of the most powerful evidence of how to address the, the trauma which is not just the childhood trauma, because actually a lot of the trauma comes from adulthood of having to engage in drug using communities that are criminalized and are therefore have these really violent structures, you know, um, within them. So there's a lot of trauma that's created through that. And you and I had a lot of conversation around it when we first started this work. The space wasn't created. And now there is. There's yeah. a drug policy task force. And what we realised is, OK, so we held the space till the people turned up. They turned up. And then what we're good at is creating new spaces. Yeah. Rather than we, do you know, the experts are all there. I am not the expert in that. And neither are you. And we don't want to be. Hopefully that issue will get dealt with appropriately. And so now we're, what we did want to say was, but this space is not getting talked about. The solution, one of these solutions could be psychedelic assisted therapy. And cannabis. I mean, yesterday at the event, and we cannabis. had several people who were really, really forceful about nobody's talking about cannabis for addiction. Yeah. We've got, I've met, there were several people at the cannabis event yesterday who have cured or, you know, have stopped their alcohol addiction by using cannabis. Mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, like yesterday, it's a Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, the three events that we're having, but Monday and Tuesday in particular were about community building and about going, right, okay, we've been on this tip for you the last few years and um, we've been funded to, to create this space. You know, we've done a lot of the back work. I've got agreement from the Scottish government that they will engage on anything to do with cannabis. We've, we've had meetings with the Scottish government about psychedelic assisted therapy. There, you know, we've had meetings with the chief scientist office, like the, the, all of the kind of networks are in place, but what we don't have is the coherent community. So, you know, we set up the Scottish Psychedelic Research Group um, 
a year and a half ago, and that's definitely coming along. I mean, like we, we have a board of four people now, but this event just showed us that we've got a real team of folk that want to do it. And I'm really excited about it because they want to run with it. You know, so our event um, on Monday was about bringing the community together and we made a call for more participants for the SBRG because we don't want this kind of like, right, we're on a board and then we're going to get everyone to do that. No, their voices are the ones that need to be heard. And similarly, I mean, yesterday with cannabis one was probably the most powerful because cannabis is, there's a real danger with cannabis that it gets implemented from top down. Yeah. Luckily, as a result of being the secretary to the cross party on medicinal cannabis, I'm a bit of a gatekeeper towards pharmaceuticals. But what we've discovered now, so we got approached by the various large pharmaceutical companies to um, engage with the Scottish government. And we said, well, you can be members of the cross party, but we're not giving you special treatment. Haven't really heard anything much back from them. But what we have found out is that now approaching individuals within health boards to use their synthetic cannabis drugs for trials. So they're bypassing the Scottish government and getting into the medical community. So there's a real sense of urgency within the community at the moment of we've got a voice. We want this voice to be heard. You know, yesterday in the room, we had some people there. It was fascinating. And I hope we've caught this back in the feedback. But, you know, I had some people there who've been involved in all the medical cannabis kind of startups, you know, around the world. And he was just a bit blown away and flabbergasted because he was like, I've never actually been to an event like this. I don't actually know what was different about it because Fiona and I are used to doing these kind of events. And these, and what, and I, but I think what was different about it was we leveled the playing field, you know, so there wasn't any experts and stuff. You know, everyone in the room there was experts, whether you're a cannabis user, a patient, somebody who was growing, you know, we had like the, the, the bunch of guys there who have the first ever cannabis um, cultivation, legal ca cultivation there. You know, we had like top... Um, you know, Mike Barnes, who's like the top neuro, neuro, neuroscientist and all this kind of stuff. So we had, we had a range of all these so-called, you know, elite positions all the way down to sort of folk that would consider themselves just a bit of a, a cannabis user. But they were all sitting in tables together and telling their story about why they were passionate about cannabis. And oh man, I mean, like the buzz in the room was just, it was just beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. But the other thing that we're really, really wanting to do, and this is where I get excited and it gets a bit weird, is um, within the cannabis and the psychedelic community, there is a growing understanding that, you know, the concept of health and well-being isn't just about a Cartesian model of, you know, doctor knows best and, you know, this, that kind of thing. Um, and so what we've been doing in our events is also bringing in an element of the sacred. So not bombarding it with like, yeah, we're all going to sit here and, you know, do jostics and kind of like sing Kumbaya, but just recognize that we're dealing with a different, we're dealing with a different way of thinking. We're dealing with a different way of being. And we're trying to connect the, the kind of mask, faceless, institutional personas that most people put across when they engage in these spaces and bring everyone down to the human level. And that seems to have worked. It seems to have worked. And, um, and one of the things, sorry, no, the, one okay. of the things that I love is, as, an, as Scottish Psychedelic Research Group, we're all open about the fact that we take psychedelics. We've used them, um, we've used them for healing, we've used them for pleasure, but we're out about that. And so many organisations will skirt round it. Yeah. At most of our events, people, we try and create events, and not everybody, obviously, can safely talk about that. But when Carol Hart put that book out and talked about it, I think we're in the next phase. I really hope we're in the next phase of drug policy because I've got most of my best drugs from harm reduction conferences, from being in the harm reduction movement. You know, I mean, I was 20 years in abstinence-based recovery, and then I meet all these incredible people who don't talk about the fact that certain substances have transformed them as human beings. Yeah. And hopefully with Scotland, with this organisation, mm -hmm. we will be able to safely talk about that and not be the lunatic fringe. And I... Got, I did a Winston Churchill fellowship and then they gave me more money. And Winston Churchill are a really, well, it's Churchill Fellowship now. They're really 
you would think, a very conservative. And I said, I want to create some space in Scotland where we can create an equitable cannabis market and bring psychedelic assisted therapy to Scotland and not in the way that it's been done in other countries, not where you have big pharma and big capitalism. And I put the application in and I thought, they're going to just like not even get back to me. And they got back to me and they gave me some money to do that. So that's some of the funding that I get. So I feel that there is a cultural change. And hopefully, hopefully we do not end up with this psychedelic industrial complex because we know where some of the funding's coming from and it's really dark funding. We're a really small country mm-hmm. and hopefully, hopefully we're small enough that those big beasts will stay away and we might be able to create our own hemp farms, our own... Not might, we will We create. will, we will, we will yeah, that's our, yeah, that's yeah, 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 our, yeah. That's our dream. Yeah. And that the people who are already, the people who were in the room yesterday, some of them are creating the most beautiful thoughtful medicines Mm. they are working underground taking huge huge risks to heal people they're running they're people who've had a whole lot of experiences themselves who are now saying people can't afford to do a five thousand pounds psychedelic retreat and even if they could, they don't want to be sitting with a bunch of hedge fund managers. They want to be sitting with their own community. So we were wanting to create a space where that becomes something that you will not risk state agents bursting in and, and breaking up and putting people in prison for and removing children yeah. for. And I, and I do think, I have a real hope that Scotland could achieve that. And it's just how do we shape that narrative and how do we change it so that the government see? And they are. The first time I spoke to somebody who was running one of the biggest um, drug organisations when I said to him about psychedelics, he just laughed and he was like, oh my God, you're just on it again. And now he understands the power of these medicines to help in all sorts of different issues. So... The massive danger, yeah, we're in a we're in a very very interesting period where we're starting to get noticed as um, people that are creating change, and that is a dangerous thing almost because it's like this has all been kind of behind the scenes, you know, with the underground, with just creating networks and stuff like that. But the moment that you start becoming people, are like, ooh, this is interesting what they're doing. And like I said, we had somebody there yesterday. You could almost see was like like flabbergasted, didn't know. I mean, am I allowed to say it? Like spare prick at a party, you know, like didn't know where he sat because within these industries, there's a whole bunch of middlemen, generally speaking men, white men, sorry, no, no, nothing, but who are, who are, have made a, a business of trying to connect governments with these industries. But what we're trying to do or what we are doing is not about connecting industries with the government, but connecting the voices of the people who use. And what was, once again, beautiful about yesterday with the cannabis stuff was like everyone in that room had a relationship with cannabis of some sort. That doesn't necessarily mean that they used it, but they used it in the past, but it was a passionate relationship with cannabis. It wasn't there about money. Yeah. Maybe there were a couple of people that, you know, obviously want to make a, a, a buck, but it was really about, we're in Scotland, man. We have the talent to do this. We have everyone behind us, you know, um, and we can do this. I mean, I just wanted to go back actually to something you'd said earlier, um, just about, um, yeah, about the narrative. Like I had, when I started my PhD, one of the first articles that I wrote was called The Role of Experiential Drug Use in Drug Policy Research. And it ties in right into what Fiona was saying. Um, Because I went and presented this at the Australian International Drug Policy Conference. Anyway, big one. It was made a lot of waves and it created a lot of conversation because so many people within the drugs policy arena use drugs but don't admit to it because they feel that it would somehow discredit them, you know. So, for example, yesterday, like, one of the people were saying, oh, you know, you should think about using the term cannabinoids instead of cannabis because there's a negative link to cannabis. I'm like, no, that, no, that's playing the game. That's, like, buying into the narrative that they want you to create, which is you can't talk about this, but you can talk about that. You know, cannabis, I love cannabis. It is a beautiful, beautiful substance. 
and it's been around for hundreds of thousands of years, why would I shift that term in order to make it more appealing to policymakers? I mean, I do understand that concept, but this is the kind of thing that fired me and Fiona up because it's like, no, we're just, we're just pussyfooting around, we're playing, you know, the, the concept of recovery having to be drug free. Well, so many of them aren't drug free because they're taking prescribed drugs. So what does that mean? Or they're smoking, can- you know, like all of these kind of languages that are kind of masking the reality of what's going on. And, um, and yeah, so that, so that was that. But I got recommended by my supervisor at the time to not come out as a drug user because they said that they would, it would impact my chances. But I could not, in good conscience, write about drug users as if they were somehow other, you know. And so I t- took the risk and I added my own experiences and, and all of my publications have, have me coming out. And I still got a job. And I've now got a permanent lectureship. I've got a feeling that they've not actually read any of my publications. <laughs> but I acknowledge the fact that it's incredibly brave that you do it, not just as an ap- academic, but as a mother. As a mother, yeah. I mean, Jesus, you know, like, it's kind of, um, yeah, it's scary, but I feel supported because I feel that, um, well, A, yeah, I, feel, I don't feel too scared but anymore, but I do wonder, you know, at times if I become more public about it. Because at the moment, like I say, Fiona and I have been skirting around the edges, not skirting around the edges, in the underground, you know, we've been, we've been in the background going, you go forward. We've been trying to put people forward. So this yeah. film, in fact, is probably one of the first times that we've decided that we're going to actually put ourselves at the front mm-hmm. and go, okay, we're here, mm-hmm. but I don't want to be at the front. I mean, it's not about us being at the front. I mean, the whole point of this is to create a collective voice. And that collective voice doesn't need to be saying the same thing, but it fundamentally needs to be based on this concept of social justice, humanity, human rights, and equity, you know? And that's the core energy that we're going for, the core energy, and, and um, I really think it'll work. And it can be really scary. I mean, as somebody who didn't use drugs for a very, very long time, um, I had lost my fear of the police. And now as somebody I am vulnerable, yeah. and I don't like them, and I'm frightened of them. So I'm very, very cautious, and we want to create safe spaces so that people are safe from those people. It just because they're dangerous hard. people, yeah, and dangerous. they're violent, yeah. and I mean, and they're self-confessed. I mean, our metropolitan police have just had to say we're mis- misogynistic and violent, and we're yeah. not safe for women. So it was a really big shift for me. And it, the shift was really bizarre because my friends would say to me, are you worried that you'll become hooked on drugs again? And I was like, no, I'm actually really worried that I could have some really big violent men come into my house and I would yeah. lose my autonomy. Yeah. yeah. No, it's... <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 um, it's, yeah, it's a real... To be fair, I just need to, I feel like I need to say, to be fair, like in Scotland, police Scotland, Scotland don't, yeah, yeah, police I live Scotland. In England. Yeah, I live in England. Now, yeah, so they've been, I mean, I, I'm sure there's loads of incidents where you could sort of say they've been awful. Like, so for example, their cannabis possession, like we have de facto decriminalisation where cannabis is um, dealt with a minor police warning. So the police just give a slip of paper and, and if they're not caught again within, I think, three to six months, then it's let off. But despite that, over 50% of all possession charges um, are with young men between the ages of 18 and 24. And on top of that, um, it's in houses and so it's all well known, you know, it's the police know who they're going for. And, you know, I've spoken to police, the, some of the guys at the police about this and they feel their hands are tied, you know, but we have got better dialogue with Police Scotland. I mean, I think this is why Scotland is quite exciting to be in at the moment because in regards to our engagement, we have good engagement with Police Scotland. We have good engagement with the Scottish Government. The Crown Office, we don't have such great engagement, but they won't engage with anyone because they want to be independent. Um, but, you know, there are, there are avenues of dialogue that don't exist at a UK level. Um, and, you know, like, for excitingly, I just found out this morning that Northern Ireland are going to be, or is it Ireland, are going to be holding a, a Citizens' Assembly on Drugs Policy. And that's something that we can really, really help with, you know. So now that they're doing that in Ireland, it could be something that we do in Scotland. Although, to be honest, a citizen's assembly, yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually was thinking about it. I'm not sure it's... Like, I'm more interested in the voices of the drug users 
and the people who have the experience of this. And I know it sounds slightly exceptionalist, but you know, you said earlier, you know, everyone involved in the psychedelic community has tried psychedelics. And then there could be an argument against that, saying, well, you know, well, what, it's a bit exclusionary. It's not, it's not including people that don't have that experience, and therefore all voices should be involved. But um, I have no problem excluding the voices of those who have not used substances in this conversation. Because the reality is, it's not about those voices, because it's not about what they think or care or feel about. It's about us. It's about how we experience the substances and how we experience that community. Um, and there's dialogue to be had, but it's, it's just interesting because in doing that, you know, the model with the opiate and the harm thing is like you've got the GP, you've got the medical professionals, you've got the treatment providers, you've got all these people. And in a million years, you'd never expect them to take methadone or any of the treatments that they're prescribing. And they will always see their clients as the drug user and me as the professional or as a policymaker. But within the cannabis and psychedelics movement, level playing field, or at least that's what we're creating, is we're creating a level playing field. And that's really getting felt. Um, and we've got a series of events coming up as well. I mean, we've got in June, we're hoping to be uh, collaborating with um, uh, David Nutt, though don't, he, he doesn't actually know this yet, but his publisher knows, <laughs> um, on an ethics around psychedelic medicine in Scotland. We've got a three-day exhibition in the Scottish Parliament at the end of September, in, which is culminating in an event. But the idea behind that is to bring the art. So the other thing as well, which is really fascinating about this, is there's a lot of creatives involved in psychedelics and cannabis. And it's people who have used those medicines and it's done them good and they want, they've been creating art out of it. So we're like, well, how do we include those voices in the policy discussion, you know, and how do we make sure that they're included? Another thing I'm absolutely passionate about is getting the, the people who are already growing and dealing, you know, involved. We haven't, I haven't really worked out ways to do that confidentiality, but there are people engaged who do engage in that. They're just not able to, to talk about it. But as we move towards actually policy development proper, we need to bring those people in. You know, they've tried to do it. I mean, I understand they tried to do it in New York, but they didn't really get it together. But you can see around the world that like folk are trying to create legislation that does have this social justice element to it and, and, and retribution, uh, restorative element to it. And we can learn from those, but then yes. we can create our own specific Scott. Scottish we can create our own, because the other thing we're tapping into as well is this energy mm -hmm. of old medicine. Mm -hmm. So the narrative is always like, oh, look at this new medicine, you know, psychedelics, new medicine, cannabis, new medicine. No, no. In Scotland, cannabis was grown for hundreds of years, if not thousands. I mean, they found seeds. It was a staple of all of the monasteries, you know, particularly with the Christian, uh, Celtic Christianity, which was deeply spiritual. Um, we have oral history. We don't necessarily have physical evidence yet of the use of liberty caps, but I mean, come on. <laughs> like, you know, they grow all over Scotland. Um, our Celtic shamanism is very similar to many of the Siberian shamanistic things. It is without a doubt we use psychedelics. So what we're trying to talk about is not bringing in a new form of substance use, but reclaiming. Our but reclaiming. And we don't know what that looks like because we don't have the lineage, or at least we don't have the physical obvious lineage because they were all killed and burnt in, in the witch trials. Um, but the intelligence of the plants will yes, tell us. the intelligence of the plants and the earth and the community. Mm -hmm. I mean, the people that we're meeting, you know, everyone has this, you know, slightly special link to Scotland. And there's just this buzz about how we're going to bring back the indigenous use of these medicines. I mean, the Amanita, the Amanita mushroom, Amanita muscaria grows all over Scotland, all over the north. And it's one of the ones that we've not had a discussion about. We hope to have a really, really um, in-depth discussion around Amanita have, do you know, I mean, they've been used for years and years. But they 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 hit the GABA receptors. One of the biggest um, factors in drug deaths in Scotland is gabapentin. <clears throat> and oh wow! So yeah, I didn't know that so, even myself. So doctors are prescribing this substance, which is actually highly toxic, and we don't really know what it's doing. 
when in, it occurs naturally in these mushrooms. We know people who are now relearning that medicine. It can be used as a tonic on the skin and have the same impact as these highly toxic, highly dangerous drugs. Yeah. You can pick this thing from your sacred ground and make this ointment. I mean, and so these are the stories that we're not, that we want to bring forward. Yeah, we just want a positive thing. You know, and, and every, because otherwise, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And they've been stolen. And, and I mean, obviously, like the, the medicines were taken Roman times, I suppose. Like we've lost, as, oh, as, we've lost, we've, as healers, yeah. we've lost a, a yeah. lot. Yeah. But there, and it does sound kind of woo woo, but the plants tell you. Yeah. The that there's an intelligence in those plants. You take them and they tell you what they need us to do. So, my understanding is that you are very skeptical about the mainstream medicalized model of. It has things. to be part of it. Obviously, it has to be part of it. But what, what kind of system do you envision? Do you have any ideas how? how the government should regulate all this field, if it should regulate. Uh, how can we make sure that, for example, not, it is not charlatans who are abusing the substances, abusing the naivety of people, you know. So it's, but this is, yeah, so this is, yeah, so this is... Um, quality, quality control. So we have so this is an the, ethics yeah, document. This ethics document that John, so John Anderson, one of our board members, has written this, woof, incredibly hefty ethics document. Um, but this is the next stage for us. So, so, so there's two things in your question there. Um, one is um, what we can do now, currently within the framework. So in regards to cannabis, um, you know, you will have seen from the presentation last, last night, and I guess you can probably just show elements of that, because with cannabis, there's some quite clear routes that we can go down. We can get a team together, which we're going to get together, to uh, get the Scottish guidance rather than the English guidance that's currently being used, but the Scottish guidance on prescribing. So that's fairly easy to do as long as we've got the people. And um, we're also looking to get a team together to get a Lord Advocate's reference. So in Scotland, Police Scotland are governed by the Lord Advocate. The Lord Advocate can make a reference to, um, to so for example, um, the Lord Advocate made a reference which reduced all of the, basically de facto decriminalization. So all possession of drugs now is dealt with a minor police warning. So, and, and that was from a Lord Advocate's reference where they basically made a statement going, we believe it's not in the public interest to, to do this. And so we could get them to do a statement, you know, well, if we had the team to develop the evidence, saying it is not in the public interest for the Scottish Police or Police Scotland to be policing, actively policing the cultivation and possession of cannabis. So that's possible. But in regards to, I mean, I think it's interesting you use the term charlatans because yes, there is all this fear around the misuse of psychedelics because it can be problematic. But I think that is more around lack of engagement of people that are using psychedelics. Um, I mean, when we were in the community there, like on Monday, that was the community of like healers and psychedelics, and they are not charlatans. Mm. You know, they're people that are doing the work. I think what you'll find, like in Scotland, I don't, I haven't yet come across any like oral evidence around the, the prob, like the really bad use, not in the same way that I've come across from England and where there's been quite a massive surge in particularly in London and places like that. But in regards to how do we see it envisaged coming into Scotland, well, we've had a, a meeting with the Scottish Government Drug Policy Division. I mean, they're really interested and keen to see um, psychedelic-assisted therapy as some form of treatment for addiction. There are already a couple of trials going on, on in the Kennedy Tower around treatment-resistant depression. I think if we create a community, yeah. hopefully it becomes self-regulating. Yeah. And the community then held each, hold each other accountable. Yeah. And I have heard there was conversations yesterday. I know a lot of men that just will now work with men, women that just work with women. We've not made an official connection with the Chikruna Institute, but they wrote an incredibly beautiful book called um, Psychedelic Justice, which I've now listened to about six times. <laughs> yes. It's just fabulous. It covers all of this. And we'll get in touch with them and yeah. pro hopefully the next one We'll do some work with them because they're fabulous. 
But I think the main thing is, is that it has to come from the community. Mm -hmm. So it's not like how, well, what would we like? It's like, well, the community will guide. Our role is to hold space for the community. Yeah. You know, like I'm not a therapist. I'm not like a psychedelic practitioner. My expertise is creating an Anfiona too. Our expertise, it, it appears, because I think we've only really just had evidence of this properly this week. Like we were over, we've been overwhelmed. Like we were not expecting these, these events to, to, to turn out this way. Yeah. We always get good attendance, but not in the same way as this. There's something shifted either with us or with the community, I don't know. But the, the point is that um, we are here to create that space, to hold that space, so that the community can then create what it needs in order to regulate itself. So going forward, we've got monthly meetings with SPRG, and what we really see is this, yeah, this d building of a momentum empowering people. So many people turned up to the events and were like, what should we do? And then by the end of it, it's like they're feeling, oh, it's not about you telling us. It's like, we're here. We can do this. You know, like, what can I do? You know, people are, you know, saying, and I'm, I'm going to send out emails and get spread lists. And oh, God, because <laughs> in the end of the day, it's just me and Fiona still doing all of this. Yeah. And so the next stage for us is to go, OK, we've just galvanized, galvanized the community. Now we need to get some structures in place to make sure that community doesn't become fragmented again. So, um, and it's, I've put, I mean, you and I have put on an awful lot of community events. Yes. And I always used to identify, you know, I'm an activist. <clears throat> and my activism's driven by rage and sometimes desperation. And what took me to psychedelics was I was burned out by it. Yeah. Like absolutely fundamentally burned out with it. And I realised that rage is not an energy that creates sustainable, yeah. healthy change. So when I mix that with the mysticism and the magic of the medicine, the two, it was like this, this two energies created and into something that's like sacred activism and, and it feels yesterday. sacred yeah. like like yeah. i am a now a sacred activist sacred activism and yes. the energy was different yes people were angry but they also had hope yeah and i've not seen that so much before fiona you mentioned that it is still very expensive to to attend a, a psychedelic retreat yeah what can we do to make psychedelic healing more accessible for people who live in poverty, uh, the most marginalized people who really need it, but now it's still a kind of upper middle class thing. At the moment, we're all underground. Yes. I've done yeah. some training, I've, you know, I've got a therapy background, I've done some training, but it, it all amounts to nothing, you know, because of the, the legalities, unless I go and do it in a different country. and. Yeah. and for all sorts of different reasons. People, a lot of my friends can't travel because of their, you know, so we're working underground. We're working underground. And a lot of those underground practitioners as we get together, I would hope that we can have some kind of permission to, and you're gonna to have to be the person that works out how we do that. Here we still have a class war. Yeah. I was really, Delighted to hear some really, really working class oh, yeah. accents at both of those yes. events and at this event who are actually giving medicine to their communities, yeah. in their communities. Yeah. Because there's something around, and I, I hear it, the idea that, you know, you have to be kind of, you know, you have to have a nice house and a nice job and a certain income to be able to handle psychedelics. Yeah. Because... Do you know, and it's like, if what we're saying is that, you know, if you don't have that and you may never have that, you shouldn't be allowed access to the divine or joy or ecstasy. Like, how yeah. dare you? Yeah. This is something that everyone should be allowed to, but to also, experience. But also in Scotland, this is like part of our cultural mm -hmm. heritage. I mean, I grew up in Scotland from the age of 14 years onwards. It was a routine on, in, in autumn. You know, when it's just right, the 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 har is just like set. It's like that mist. You got, you know, it's it's a routine and a ritual that many Scottish adolescents go through, and then it's forgotten about, or you know, they move on to the harder drugs or whatever you want to call it. But there is a, I mean, 
you know, like we were up uh, north um, in, in the autumn last year and we were looking for mushrooms. And it was hilarious because like all the locals were like, oh, I getting a wee, getting a wee forage in then. And I was like, aye, aye. And so, you know, so it's part of our culture, you know, our underground culture. And, the, you know, so really it's about, yes, how do we empower people from, you know, the, the sort of the class, working class environment, but actually they're all doing it anyway. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it's actually not about empowering them to do it right or anything like that. It's about getting those voices in yeah. to say, we've been doing this already. And, you know, this is what we're doing. And it's, it's fantastic. So you're right, you know. And yeah. I had a conversation with a woman who was like really well meaning, you know, and she said, do you know, Fiona, it's like, no, actually it was a guy. And he'd said, you know, how do you send, how do you give people this incredible experience where they're open to the beauty of the universe and then you send them back to a tower blog? And I said to him, how do you have this incredible experience that the universe is one and then you go back to your white male misogyny and work for a capitalist organisation yeah. that you know is raping the planet? Yep. Yeah. You know, I mean, what absolute nonsense yeah, yeah, yeah. that we would say this to people. Yeah. One thing I want to finish up on, though, was just to say that um, when Fiona and I did events before, um, we always felt really drained at the end. But yesterday, we were like, oh, my God, I don't feel drained. I feel really energized and really like, oh, going, going, going. But um, yeah, we're going to have we've got our final event today, so we better get our skates on. So we were talking about media and how you want to work with the media. And that's why... We use quite a big bit of our budget to bring you guys over because yep. actually media is toxic and you're not. Oh, okay. You know, so we wanted you. Yeah. Training. Yeah. yeah. And that was part of it. It yeah. wasn't like by accident or because we think, I mean, we do think you're fabulous, but. But no, we had conversations about trying to get like the Herald and the Independent and everything, but they were like, no, actually. Like, so we want Drug Reporter, Reporter yeah. and Counterman because it's the two kind of like organisations that are about the user voice. Yeah. And then we can send those to the politicians and the ministers and everything like that. But we don't need, the events have shown us that we don't need the media behind us because actually the media might even complicate matters. What we need is the user voice because we have the links to the government. We have all of that. So we just need recording sheets about how many people turned up and what they said. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there's enough knowledge about psychedelics around there already that we don't need to get that advertisement out. So.